Welcome to our Ad Dot podcast with your host, uh, Vaughn Vernon. That's me. And uh, I have as guests today, Diana Montalian, and we're going to discuss systems and systems thinking. And this is a more popular topic than it was, uh, you know, even a few years ago. It's People are starting to think a lot about um, systems and the way that systems are designed and architected in software and in other ways too. Uh, but Diana has uh, specialized in systems thinking. It's even kind of the way that, um, you know, she's been thinking for a long time and I hope that we can all learn something from her today. So welcome, Diana. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's always lovely to be invited to talk about things I'm excited to talk about. <laughs> Great. Okay, so when we talk about systems thinking, um, it's obviously a different way of thinking than, let's say, a lot of people think or are, are more traditional uh, way of thinking about software systems. And one of those patterns of thought is uh, referred to as linear thinking. So could you explain or describe, first of all, before we get into systems thinking, what is linear thinking? Um, yeah, so in all the different types of thinking overlap. Right, so we're making a boundary. It's not a hard and fast rule, but for sure, linear thinking is so familiar to us that we think of it as thinking, right? So the way that we design education, for example, where you learn one concept and you practice it and then you build the, the next concept, um, the way that we think of architecture and, I'm sorry, agriculture, in other words, are getting close overlapped for me, but in agriculture now, this move to monocrops and efficiency, the way that we, um, that we want to move towards growing food in, in science. So the scientific method is all of these are versions of linear thinking or approaches to linear thinking. And so again, because it's so familiar to us, it's usually what we mean when we just use the word thinking. All right. And then if we contrast that with systems thinking, how do how does our thinking process change with system thinking? So when we're thinking in systems, there's a few things that are different. When we're, we tend to be thinking about the relationships between things, right? So linear thinking tends to take a, a, a slice of something and describe it. Whereas in, when you're thinking in systems, you're thinking about how different pieces work together or different aspects of an ecosystem impact each other. And Instead of, this is similar to silos, right? When in technology, we see this a lot, right? How we're, we build things and we end up with people and technology in silos, as opposed to thinking about how you interact different components so that they can start to um, uh, show you things that you wouldn't necessarily have designed on your own, right? So you're creating um, healthy components and a healthy system that grow and expand over time as opposed to very concrete, hard-coded solutions. So it is more about um, uh, thinking about the patterns or synthesizing knowledge and information into um, into helping you to understand a current circumstance without thinking that one circumstance is every circumstance. Yeah, so it's a more holistic way of problem solving. All right, so probably then if someone is pretty good at recognizing problems before they happen, maybe they are already thinking in a systems way. For example, they, they design and implement a piece of code, even with a unit test. And it seems like everything is working in the unit, but 
um, how might those design choices affect other parts of um, the surrounding code? Is is that anything? Does that have anything to do? Yeah, I mean, it's it's tricky because systems thinking that um, is not really well defined. So you have many different areas of focus. So in marketing, it's a very it's a very popular term, and so it's tricky to um, it's tricky to tricky for us to say systems thinking is one is one particular thing but i think it's pretty easy for us in technology because we are always building things that are interacting with other things and certainly as the people building technology we are always interacting with with um we're always interacting with other people and and other uh, it, and thinking and thinking about the impact. So pattern thinking, I think, is also an equally good way. We could call it pattern thinking, call it systemic reasoning. And so in the case that you're describing, we are thinking about the the test in the circumstance that's going to do what it is we need it to do. But we're also thinking about the patterns that could repeat themselves across the system to test for this particular kind of thing. Or also, is this thing that I'm testing for, is it really a localized issue? Or is this something that arises because of an infrastructure choice we've made upstream or downstream that's causing the problem? So we don't just keep band-aiding the, the, the symptom of the problem, but we're also thinking about causes outside of this single moment verifiable instance of that problem. And we're doing those simultaneously. We're fixing the problem or we're writing the test and we're we're taking care of what we need to take care of, right, in the moment. But we're also thinking about what shares the same qualities or shares the same patterns with what we're experiencing. And our goal is to improve the improve that as a whole. Like if we can make a change that alleviates the need for what it is we're concerned about in the moment, then we would also be uh, constructing that or thinking about that. Good. And I like the um, description that you give of using patterns or th pattern thinking because uh, most pattern styles or um, maybe we would call them pattern templates as in software patterns um, have a, a section called uh, consequences. And of course, at the beginning of every um, pattern, we the, our template will say like why we use this. What's the the justification for um, this pattern's existence? What kinds of problems does it solve? But then under the consequences, it's really discussing trade offs. There are always positive and negative uh, trade offs that we have for using any kind of approach, like um, I think we both agree that it depends is, is quite an important, um, you know, uh, term to, to throw into every single discussion about systems, uh, large or small. So yeah, we're, we're considering the consequences of doing certain things using certain pattern. Is that fair? Yeah, and my favorite example of this is an, is actually not tech but McDonald's in the sense of that if we think of it from a linear perspective, um, the uh, effectiveness or efficiency, and also if we define success as a whole bunch of money, then McDonald's has more money than, than like, it's kind of unimaginable to me that that, that earns. And, but that definition of efficient and successful doesn't include the impact of the trash from all of the meals or from the, on the ecosystem um, and on the body for eating food that's very processed and, and uh, all that goes into that and the medical repercussions for that. So, and that's not saying bad or wrong one way or another, it's just saying that it's a very excellent example of a linear model and also the way that we think about it often doesn't include exactly what you're saying, right? We don't, what are the consequences or the impact and holding that together 
with our mental model of McDonald's, right? So that we don't take away all of the uh, the, the bigger complexity with that 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 system as it is. We don't take away all of the complexity of the impact that it has by simply measuring a particular metrics, like how much does it earn? And I think you've used the term mind shift, maybe to describe um, the way that we need to change our thinking in order to be systems thinker. Well, it, in my in my because I work in the web world, I was really forced to go from because I worked on you know big pieces of web software to now you know interrelated multi-platform systems of software services all all the, it's you know there's a lot more complexity and so um and so i was focusing on a number of different things to help you know myself and and my the people that i'm working with and the systems themselves and when i would speak i was trying to come up with the things that help us do this and with their tools that do it for example right <laughs> like, like that we really need but the challenge in, in multiple scenarios and among my colleagues too, is this mind shift, is the, go, is the, the, the challenge in going from, uh, from such a conditioned way of, of viewing pretty much the whole domain of what we do to a whole different skill set. yet it seems like we were still, it seems like you're still doing the same thing now we're still whiteboard testing for JavaScript in both, in both cases and during hiring, but the challenges and why we would fail, and we know this, I mean, we know this, we know that communication is the reason that most software or systems of software projects struggle, right? Because, But that's simply because whatever system we build, that's what we thought about. So we think and we communicate, and as a result of the thinking and communicating, we end up with technology. So every time if you look at the code you see the way people were thinking and communicating right so this is conway comes conway's law in every discussion but it's also the other way around then if i need to build differently or build systems that relate differently then we have to change the way we're thinking and communicating in order to do it and i don't mean this as a touchy feely it's, it's important how we communicate i mean literally they're the same thing what we think and talk about is what we will literally build and so i think i mean it's not just tech it's certainly the web is a great metaphor for the giant graph that is the systems of our world right so the the pandemic and supply chain issues all of these things um the impact on climate our behavior, the impact on climate, all of these require systemic approaches to try and resolve and tech's no different than that. Yeah, that's um, pretty striking to think about those uh, situations that we're facing now in everyday life. Um, I was, what you, something you said there kind of reminded me too of, um, uh, I will scratch this. I just have to gather my thought here because I don't know. I had something else pop into mind and I just kind of hang on five, four, three, two, one. What was I thinking? Um, <laughs> hold on. Uh, thinking, I don't know. Uh, oh, here's what it was. Okay, so something that you said there uh, and about Conway's law reminded me of something that I think even good communication structures, the people within those don't necessarily consider, and that is it's not just a matter of people having good conversations. It is your definition of good what is a good conversation in a systems uh, design and architecture effort. For example, have you uncovered all the corner cases, right? Mm. And how do you do that? So the quality of conversation doesn't mean that we all just get along and have a lot of agreement. In fact, that may be one of the worst um, communication structures we can have not that we want to be argumentative, 
but are we challenging our assumptions that we bring into a conversation, a design uh, setting? <clears throat> and as we do that, are we actually uncovering the non-obvious things? What, what's your comment on that? Yeah, well, this is my favorite. This is my absolute favorite area. Um, like, and, and has been the focus of, of most of my workshopping recently because it makes for exactly what you're saying, right? We, we have linear thinking tends to be binary. Something is, you know, um, yes or no, Democrat or Republican. This is a very binary, um, reinforces binary. And so... That also means you're either arguing or agreeing, right? So you're in this world of yes and no and arguing or agreeing. And one of the most essential practices to shift is to shift towards argumentation. And what argumentation is, is that together we're going to come up with the best possible solution under these circumstances. And we're going to share an understanding that of these circumstances, like ensure we understand the circumstances the same. Um, that we can, despite uncertainty, like we know that we can't know, we don't know. So in order to construct that, it's built on reasons. Every time we make a decision, we've done so for either explicit, explicit or often, more often, maybe too often, implicit reasons. And so when we get together, it's easy to say, well, I don't agree with that. Well, I do agree with that. We're, we're, we're engineering by opinion right? Like it, whose opinion gets to be stronger. But in the practice of systemic reasoning, when you and I get together, you'll say, these are the reasons that convince me. Like, here's what I, here's, here's how I came to this conclusion. And then I can make up my own mind and I can contribute reasons that you might not have considered or something about one of your reasons that makes it incorrect. And then if you design doing that with different domain points of view. Like, so you do that with people who will see this, the system very differently and you engage in reasoning with them, then you get something sound in the middle, something that has cohesion. It still won't be perfect and it still can't be right because you don't know, but it'll be sound. And the vast majority of those um, choices either work out the way you hope them to, or lead you to what you needed to know in order to help them to, to work out. And as opposed to this sort of willy-nilly, everybody's running around going in 700 different directions all the time, and then, you know, something, something will work out. Well, but a lot of it doesn't, yeah. Yeah, so argumentation doesn't mean um, adversarial. Right. Uh, it's very to, collective, to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so... We're, we're taking different positions, different viewpoints, but it's not with the purpose of making others look bad or feel bad or, um, you know, want to walk away from the effort. But instead, uh, don't you think that people have to bring the right mindset in that yeah. they're not defending turf, but they're really um, trying to find the uh, traps that that may be in front of them that they don't see because they're not, they haven't turned the corner yet. Right. Everyone that's is, it's one of the hardest things about this practice. As soon as you have somebody in the room whose basic position is, I don't care what you say or change my mind, convince me, then you're not doing systemic reasoning or argumentation because um, change my mind isn't, each individual is changing their own mind and they're doing it through critical listening and responding. So it's a, it's a leaning in process. And our goal is to, you know, it's, it's like if it's like what ideally is a code review is <laughs> not always in practice, but is ideally a code review is that the goal is to make it strong, help it to be stronger by sharing expertise, right? You've put all your expertise and then other people with similar but different expertise will help make it stronger so that when it goes forth, um, it's, it's better than it was when it started. And that's what we're doing when, um, that's what we're doing with our own thinking and other people's thinking, right? Is we're collectively strengthening it, but mostly we're just 
strengthening our reasons for acting, right? They, as, like, this is as good as we can do under the circumstances. This is as good as we can do. And that's all we can ever really hope for. And mo all of the, um, all, all, most of what we do when we're arguing, only arguing and agreeing is um, we're actually then, um, we're sort of blind, we're gonna blindly uncover what we don't know anyway but the the purpose of and i and i think a purpose of architecture is exactly what you're saying is about structuring the discussions so that they create cohesion so they create that you can take an action with at least some reasonable sense that you're going in a matterful direction and you're going in a matterful direction right now and not for one thing or another but for the for the mission as a whole yeah, and I, I think something that you said earlier really resonates with me because, you know, we're, well, of course, I'm often talking about domain-driven design. Um, one of the biggest problems that I see, and not so like this is a unique observation of my own, but obviously, um, you know, software developers, engineers, architects don't often see eye to eye or even get along with business people and yet business people are often the system thinkers in the organization like you said sales marketing they're thinking holistically how do we move this boulder you know forward how do we push this rock and of course it's not just push, but it's pull and it's fine, you know, all these experiment, you know, we experiment to try to find out how to do this and convincing people to change their thinking and buy this, right? <laughs> That's one of the hardest problems anybody has. And now we're learning that <clears throat> it's rare that software developers have that way of thinking. Oops, right? Right, and that it's, it, I have, I confess that I, I um, yes, one of my, it's bigger than a pet peeve, so I don't know what the word is, but it's the process of the knowledge is king idea that a particular expertise in a particular technology or coding language or whatever is then what we should test and or haze each other to see whether or not they those same things happen but it's the ability to synthesize and integrate and to 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 keep connected the why to the what to the how that changes things like that's what actually makes makes transformations happen in, in the intentional, the things that we're trying to do. And so the, I have, <laughs> I have learned the most as an architect from having to communicate and create an artifact with the accountant to ask for the millions of dollars we need to do for the system. Like, because we don't, we speak such a different language and we have such different mental models that we might as well be starting uh, right there's a, a great Star Trek: The Next Generation episode where the character speaks in metaphor, and the whole the whole um, episode is Picard trying to understand anything about what this this character was saying, and it, that's what it feels like to me. And so the 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 reason it matters to do, I mean many reasons, but the reason one of the reasons it matters to do is that. When you're not able to come to a satisfying decision, it's often that people don't, people, if there are five people in the room, and if you ask them what the core domain is that they're serving, like what is it that we as an organization do? What do we do that matters? So what does this system have to do that matters? They often have completely different answers to that question. And so they're each um, correctly, potentially speaking for the answer to that question, but they don't have, they're not, they're not actually asking the same question. And so it's a, it's a huge time and energy waster. And so for, um, for, for me, a lot of what we've worked on, 
um, together as teams is the ability to um, uh, is the ability to keep the whole picture together. So the you know every job story has a so that I can so that I can something that does something that matters to the mission now. And I've heard the same you know people oh I don't need to talk talk business. Like, because then you get to do the things that really make a difference. Like then that's how, because that's how you get the money and that's how you get the ability is you make a good case for, um, for it. And I, I, I confess uh, my strategy has become that I partner with people who speak business language really well. Cause I think I've got it. I think I'm, I mean, I think I'm great and, and I've got my message down and then it's pointed out to me gently how I'm still talking tech at people. I, I, I really think I've got it. And then I don't, I still, it's still very geeky twist to how I'm putting it. So it's another thing too. We don't have to do this all ourselves, right? We, by working with other people, you get the benefit. If you have someone who speaks really well, sales, really well, business, really well, tech, really well, whatever other component might need to be in there, then the message that, that you create together is going to be much stronger than anyone, anyone could have done alone. So there's, there's strength in that, creating that, that cohesion and doing it together. You get more of what you need. <laughs> it's more effective. Great. So I think we've maybe described systems thinking versus linear thinking uh, fairly well so far, but maybe what we haven't um, just kind of nailed down is why is then systems thinking so important right now today for software? Okay, let's stick with software right now. Um, I know it could be applied in many places, but what's going on that we really need to think this way? How's it going to help us? Yeah, well, I mean, in my in my neck of the woods, so to speak, it's it's pretty inescapable in that kind of like I was saying, it did, um, uh, if you needed a, a website or a web application, for example, then you'd install something like Drupal and then you'd add custom module after custom module, right? Um, uh, the Wikipedia, for example, same thing. It's a, a lamp stack software, wiki software, media wiki, and you'd have multiple, multiple, multiple instances of this single software that you can add extensions to and, um, and meet digital needs. But now every time anything gets shared digitally, it often needs to be, um, experienced in all kinds of different, all kinds of different, uh, contexts. I can ask my fridge to tell me about banana allergies, right? That, and so, so we, the, we no longer have a concept of a, of a single application and everyone comes over and, and visits it. Now everything, there's a um, interrelationship, there's the distribution of things, there's the shifting of context, there's standardization. And so now um, uh, for me, I could write PHP and add a module and put it in. And now there's um, uh, multiple platforms of um, numbers of different types of services just to make up one platform and then how we design event-based interactions across the system of multiple platforms in spaces that used to be a single piece of software. And so I know that that's not just in, um, in the, the digital side of things, but that it's a challenge in many, many different software ecosystems simply because this interconnectedness of data and information and experience and all of this is 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 just expanding so rapidly so rapidly we can't really keep up with it and what has what happens often is then you'll try and take a linear approach to these types of challenges and you end up with even more challenges. And then people will say, well, microservices is bad, it's overcomplicated. Sure, because your first attempt is almost always to create the same type of linear process that was in the original software in, uh, uh, in, after you've done, tried to split it apart. And this is fine, we go through this, 
it's a practice, right? This is a practice of, of transforming, but it's not, and, and there's tech, I mean, the, the, so much of the functionality in the pandemic is from the systems that we're interrelating and the data, just the data systems to track things like vaccinations. Like we suddenly have this um, uh, much more, at least I think surface, on the surface awareness now of how interconnected, right? It, it is social media and all the, the challenges with social media because we're like, well, the whole, if you interconnect the whole world, there's all kinds of both good things and evil things that can happen at the same time. So it's pretty inescapable, I think. Um, and and, and I, I feel a, a responsibility myself to um, continue to try and build things and design things and put things into the world that are useful and, and do no harm. And it's harder and harder to actually be able to assess the potential impact of so many of the decisions that we're making. So it just brings a whole new level of, of work that has to happen that wasn't there when I get up in the morning and put on my headphones and start writing code, right? Like, it's a little, I kind of miss that. <laughs> so we're connected to just about everything. I guess uh, if, if you're in the kitchen and um, you're better half, at least for me, it's better half, uh, opens the refrigerator door and says, honey, there's a doctor in the fridge, right? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of like, uh, yeah, there, you know, the amount of information flow that we have available to us at any given time is just um, stunning. And it's not like decreasing. <laughs> No, yeah, and it, in the, and also the, the 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 thing when you take away structure is we have to remake structure. Like not all of that is is worth our time, energy, and attention. And there's a ubiquitousness of it too. And to some extent, our technology systems also also um, can bring some element of, of cultural structure and discernment to, to what's valuable or what matters or what we will do or we won't do. And not to even open the door on a whole moral question, because I don't, I don't, I think that's out of scope. I certainly for, for most of us on most days, but I think the point is that we want to build, um, we want to build things that have integrity. And so now that word isn't, isn't just that we're doing test-driven development. <laughs> like that word, uh, the things that we build have integrity um, is becoming a more and more complex thing to design. And the people systems that are involved and the, uh, the cultural biases, all the things that end up as part of the equation, it's a more, um, it's more challenging all the time and it needs, a, it needs structure, but not too much structure. Right. So what's the balance? That's part of that's part of systems design, too. Right. Is it's all trade offs. It's trade offs all the way down. So when you know these when you're making these kinds of choices, you're always also making other choices by what you don't do. And um, that's a that's more complicated than a list of product requirements, for sure. There's a saying, anything you can do, I can do meta. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to say that I'm quoting you um, as saying that. How, can you explain yourself? Anything yeah, you the, can do, I, can the, I, I think I, I, I just, it's very funny. It makes me chuckle when you say that, that the, um, the interpersonal aspect of creating software together or systems of software together I didn't experience it certainly early in my career as something high on the <laughs> high on the the list of priorities of the skill set but now there's there's a lot more uh, emotional and intuitive complexity to even just to our communication about how we're designing and how we're designing systems how we're we're 
moving more and more into the modern era. So metta is um, means loving kindness. So it's a like mindfulness is a very becoming a very known word that's originally from a Buddhist practice of awareness, right? Awareness of your uh, thinking and experience and the present moment. And metta is often a um, integrated practice where you're also um, noticing what arises in relationship to other people, right? And so, and it's about moving, moving yourself to some extent to uh, be less reactive and more aware of both yourself and, and of others and of the impact of others. And so that seems to be a completely separate thing from architecting technology systems. But of course, what we're doing in technology systems is designing relationships between technology parts that are effective and, and do what we need them to do. And we do this by gathering and synthesizing the expertise of other people and in discerning that with our own expertise to know the difference between something that would um, get where we need to go and not. So there's a tremendous amount of this empathetic sorting and also changes is, um, is challenging. It's challenging for a lot of reasons, but it's often emotionally challenging. And so you're not, you're not just processing the logic of other people, right? You're processing also other people's experiences, emotional experiences, intellectual experiences. All, all I have to do in a meeting is bring up the word agile. And then the people who've had very good experiences get that happy face. <laughs> the people who've had very bad experiences get the scowly face. Like, so even just words you need to use can often trigger people's traumas of, and I mean that in a very, very light way, right? People's very negative experiences. So this ability Ability to bring a not just a sense of um, respect for other people's thinking, but also a, an embodied um, willingness to be kind as you're going through this, or to make space for um, for the process, will then help you make a system that's friendly. Like the parts will be friendly to each other, right? Like that that um, the same the qualities and the people will be the qualities in the in the technology. Yeah, so you, we've already discussed a little bit, or you mentioned a few things about COVID-19, the pandemic, and we can imagine that many, many people have experienced uh, real great difficulties, hardships through, because of loved ones, family members, friends suffering, dying from the pandemic. And we hate to even bring that up, but it's very real. And, uh, you know, what has that done to their family dynamics? Everybody's going to bring that into work. What does that have to do with systems thinking and, and meta? Well, so what's been interesting is that this is totally anecdotal, right? Just from my own experience and colleagues and conversations that I've been having. But one of the things that seems clear in this very tiny little subset of, of data that I am gathering is that the challenge between um, our linear thinking and our wanting to, to cling to that experience and our wanting to have some control, um, you know, to Gantt chart our life and, and everything will work out, um, you know, and our, and people who, who are more, um, uh, not just thinking thinking about systems, but trying to move and improve and make them healthy, either healthy again or healthy in a way that they haven't been, that the tension between that is worse than it was, say, two years ago. That um, that, that, that dynamic of rock logic versus water logic, right? The ability to sort of flow through these, these changes with a lot of awareness to what's happening and a lot of um, doing things that actually help, right? Which can seem smaller sometimes um, versus this very concrete and rock type of logic of there's one answer, if we find it that there's a one right answer and, and that I'm seeing this on teams too, with people that are, um, like entrenchment is becoming more entrenched or there's more fear, more, 
uh, more arguing, right? More arguing or agreeing. And not, not in a way that I think is um, a suddenly a structural problem. I just think that day to day, we're really seeing our, our, this mental fluidity and flexibility and sort of being able to roll with changes and with circumstances is not generally easy for people at all. And that um, there are so many things pulling on us in so many different directions. We also need a critical thinking in that ability to discern between all of this information and that, and that's really exhausting too. So I, I think it's really, um, on one hand, I think it has helped us to have a lot of the conversations we've needed to have because we need to have them or there's a more shared language around it. And at the same time, I think that people are really um, often physically experiencing how challenging it can be to change or when things change. And the more reticent people are to change, the more challenging it can be to then, you know, continue trying to work things out together. Yeah. I have uh, something in mind here. I think it's, it's going to be kind of a leading question, but why does the story of Sisyphus continue <laughs> to arise when we talk about systems thinking. And I think that that might lead to some concrete examples of technology decisions. Yeah, so, um, so it, I love Sisyphus, Sisyphus. I like, um, when I think about, I, I like to look at different pictures that tell the story of Sisyphus. But I think I think we all we all know that there's some percentage of our investment in in communication about technology, whatever we're coming to a decision that is going to feel wasted, right? That you're trying to get a group of people to um, make a well reasoned decision and and act on it, and there's a lot of loss. Of that happens in that um, happens in that process, and it, early in my career, I, I honestly was so happy to be doing. Like I just found it all very exciting, and so I really just would do all that glue work, like all the all the things that I, anything four in the morning for a code review, sure, anything that needed to happen to keep that communication integrity happening and to keep people communicating, keep the synergy happening. And it took me a while to realize that people would often just let me do that, not do it on their own. If I stopped doing it, things would just fall apart. But we weren't, we weren't really, it didn't really change our ability necessarily to move forward or just having, you know, in investing all the communication energy and the rock slides back down, investing all the communication energy, rock slides back down. We start all over again. You know, we one step forward and 40 steps back. And so I began to then investigate how to not do that. Like how, how can you, how can you, without oversimplifying, you know, without having it be, well, if we're, if we add a lot of control and we have a template for every decision and we make every decision according to this one template, it'll be really easy. And so it, what it started me towards what I call artifact driven. And by this, I mean that if we're having, if we're, you and I, for example, let's say we're trying to, um, we're going to meet to have a conversation to figure out what we want to do about um, uh, the, the relationship between, say, search and, and data that we have stored elsewhere. And we're trying to figure this out. I'd start with what I started calling a top-down elaboration, and now I don't even remember why I started calling it that, but that a, sh a brief sentence or so of why, like why does this matter and why does this matter now to our mission, what we're talking about, before we would then get into the how. And I started, um, I started always explicitly trying to, even if it's just one page, create an artifact or some document model, we can open up Miro, anything that actually helps to give some structure to what we're going to try and, and, and figure out together, right? And so I was once in an architectural review um, 
and one of one of my colleagues was saying, um, we need Kubernetes. Why do we need Kubernetes? Because we don't have Kubernetes. <laughs> Which I love, and I am sure I have made that argument. <laughs> Nobody has ever heard anyone say that before. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> happens all the time. Yeah. Right? And and so so we we then really needed to kind of change our habits when we talk about these decisions to be able to like people will say oh you, you can make this or this change and it'll be faster it'll be more performant or it'll be more scalable do we actually need it to be faster like what's the impact of faster and what's the loss of faster and faster is nice and fun and good and who doesn't want their systems to be faster, but sometimes it actually is not the highest priority thing to focus on. So, um, so especially moving from a, a monolithic software into uh, into component systems, sub of subsystems, platforms, whatever that 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 architecture is, um, it was so much easier to go back to that Sisyphus. Um, model of just endlessly arguing or agreeing about things like we this team shares one opinion this team shares another opinion no one has to actually describe how they came to that conclusion they can just say graphs don't scale we're not doing graphs like right and then that's it and bringing in or by the use of of the structuring of um you know, even just what we wrote down iterating and iterating to try and get towards something that helped us get something more sound from, from the, basically I became very precious about my time, energy, and attention. And that if I was going to, and if I wasn't focusing on doing deeper work, if I wasn't diving into something and we were going to exchange things then I needed it to be sometimes even joyful, where it was like, oh, yes, now, yes, yes, now this has solved three problems in one discussion. So um, I think one thing I want to add is that um, we confuse persuasion with influence. So for a lot of us, uh, there's always the question of how much politics, how much politics is involved in actually getting everything done. And I am a purist and I would say that ideally there would be no politics. Politics is often mo the most Sisyphus aspect, but that are we trying to persuade others to think as we do or to share the way that we're thinking or the problems that we're solving in the way we're solving them? Or are we want to influence their thinking and we want to influence their decision in the right way? And you really do communicate differently whether or not you're trying to persuade, which is more the advertising way, or influence, which is I want what I say to be trustworthy. I, you might not be what you want to hear, but it's trustworthy, right? Whereas persuasion would never say what you don't want to hear. And, and I don't know how an architect makes it through the first seven minutes of their career without having to tell somebody something that they don't want to hear. So getting good at that is really essential. Yeah, so Sisyphus is, um, you know, according to the account, one individual, but this sounds actually more like hurting cats or maybe even worse, hurting chickens or something? And how, when, so one of the challenges, and people have talked a lot about glue rolls or integrators, right? It's the people, these were the systems thinkers when we were mostly thinking in software, right? So it's the people that was always building the bridges and synthesizing different views in the domain, right? And so when you approach from a domain-driven design perspective, for example, you, in, you begin there, you begin through synthesis and integration, right? That's the entire point. But most people don't, they don't begin there, right? They begin from a disintegrated place and then they have to be integrated. And so for a long time, I mean, I, at least a decade in my experience, I feel like Cold, we really didn't get that. Like we were having the glue rows be cat herders. Like, oh, you're really good at getting. But I, I was always like, well, what the cats actually have a responsibility here. Like you don't get to just be a cat. Like that's not a thing. Like, and so you don't have the one person who has to be the cat herder and everyone else can just be cats. Like how do we raise the water level a bit so that you don't need a cat herder 
because you don't have cats, right? Or at least we have an awareness of all of our own felineness and how really we are not inclined generally to <laughs> synthesize with other people's thinking. We, and um, uh, what's their phrase? Um, strong opinions loosely held, right? So with cats, there's strong opinions and there's no rest of that sentence. <laughs> Some might conclude that um, hurting cats is difficult, but hurting chickens, I think cats are way smarter than chickens, but that, you know, does that give one the advantage over the other? I don't know. I don't know, but. but I don't know, <laughs> smart. <laughs> Boy, there's some like, oh, that's a whole nother. There's a whole nother conversation in intelligence and the types of intelligence and all. I will say though, I do have I do have chickens. And when my chickens occasionally get free and I try to get them back into their area, they do not understand the concept of door. They will be like banging into the game, to the the fence beside the door, whatever. So my cats are easier than my chickens, for sure. Um, but my chickens, even though they want to come for food, can't quite figure out how to do that. Yeah, like, why would we want to do that? Um, well, I, I think you probably just need a very large bag of grain and a lot of time to get them back in the door yeah so they make anyway. it they do they make it eventually but it is exactly that it's patience it's like throw it and they're like they see it they're very excited it just takes them a bit to work it out <laughs> work out the yeah, yeah. Not, not that we'd compare people to chickens or cats but um not at all well okay let's say now systems thinking in software projects, programs, large, complex efforts, but someone needs architecture, right? Everybody, well, that's another challenge is just <laughs> convincing some organizations that they actually need software architecture. But let's assume that we are working with people who can appreciate software architecture. How does that change with systems thinking? So, um, so sorry, it's, it's my favorite subject in there. I think through three, three, five things are all jumping in my head at the, at the same time. But I, and I know that you and I, we, we chuckle about this. So it's true that I was giving a talk at a conference and someone sat down and said, oh, speak, oh, you're an architect. I want to be an architect, but I don't know enough about Kubernetes yet to be an architect. <laughs> like, oh, oh, I don't know if this is the table you had wanted to, <laughs> to end up on. That um, I think the challenge, there, it's totally fine that even that when we say, how do we help people know they need architecture? The answer is like, and, and what is architecture even? Like, what is architecture and architect? What do we mean in this? And this is an endless discussion. And to some extent, it's fine that there are lots of different definitions, right? It's fine that people are predominantly architecting using um, a, a specific tool set or solving people in a specific, or become an expert in, in a specific tool set. But um, uh, for me, the role, at least from, from a systems point of view, is that I took on, a, as, a, as an example, I took on um, architecting a systems change. And this was a like business critical systems change and would have a huge impact and wanted to begin by understanding how the system worked now. And it, it had a very, um, a, it was the system as a whole published, was publishing, right? So it published an article and then that article um, used to be printed and on the website. But over time, of course, because we live in a world where now there's many, many destinations for information, it went to like 42 different places. So when I tried to model the system, I discovered that no one knew 
what all the pieces did. They only knew, and, and in, the, in the beginning, everyone did. But over time, these pieces got added on and added on and added on like a Rube Goldberg machine, right? Where you have these disparate pieces. And there was a little Python script in the middle that nobody remembered who wrote that if it went down, the whole thing would have gone down, right? This, this one little tiny script. And so I, the first thing I did was sort of write a story of, of, how, of how the article moves through the system. So it's, um, it's, it's, we don't see generally, right, um, how this has sort of crept up on us. I, I think completely on the side, I'm doing a, um, taking a course on a focus course that I'm really enjoying and it has a digital declutter month. And so my team and I are doing this digital declutter. Oh my goodness. I didn't see how digital use has crept up during the pandemic. Like I didn't used to own a television and now I was like, how many streaming services am I signed up for? Right. But I'm an example of how the whole world is now, right? That that these these changes have happened and we've sort of taped them and duct taped them together, but now we actually need to think of them as a whole and we need to think of the impact that they're having and how can we transform them so that it works more efficiently and effectively together. Um, and if you're starting from scratch now, there's no very, in, in my world anyway, there's very few th- even if I were going to do a tiny, um, tiny, uh, I was going to publish recipes of a very specific pomegranate recipes, for example, very specific, I would still have those recipes would be engaging with how many different systems that have how many different schema formats. Like, so it's just no escaping. Uh, it's no escaping, I guess. Don't forget about the telling everybody the history of pomegranates and your history with pomegranates in those recipes. Yeah, right. (laughs) And you have to, you Uh, have to put. uh, Wait, I just want to learn how to use this. (laughs) So this in in your question was to art, to an architect, right? Is that, um, is that the, the, the linear processor. And I've had a number of discussions with other architects is the architect, the senior engineer, the most experienced engineer. And I think all these different, and what is an enterprise architect? I all think these different things can be value, valuable in context. But to your question about how do we help or, um, people understand and organizations understand they need architecture is through the pain. This is what happens when you're not doing architecture. Architecture will do itself. So it's sort of like in meditation when they say the mind is like a toddler and if you don't give it something to do, it will go find something to do. And, you know, our, our software systems are, are often emerging in the same way, right? Where they're duct taped together. And if you want to make them emergent, meaning that the sum of the parts is greater than the individual parts, that's a job. That's somebody's job. Conceptual integrity is somebody's, has to be, someone has to be speaking for the conceptual integrity across the parts of the system. Or it'll just happen. (laughs) Yes. And I just want to say, no Kubernetes pods were hurt in this, (laughs) in this podcast. Oh. Well, Kubernetes has its place. Like if that little obscure uh, Python script that nobody knew about fails, boom, we have a great reason to use Kubernetes. But it's not the only thing to know or even most of the things to know about software architecture. And that's the thing is, right, we're just kind of drop the shiny toys and, well, actually our brains are the most interesting shiny toys that we have, you know, and, yeah. and another thing to realize is that everybody's system is just someone else's subsystem. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's, oh, there's so, there's so much in that is, um, there's so much in, in, out of linear thinking, we tended to make boundaries uh, 
mental boundaries around like we made boundaries around a website for example as like it was a concrete thing with a moat around it but now of course we see that we just made that up it actually is just part of the the inter right the um uh the interrelationship between between things right so this question of you know what even you think about impact well how far out back to the mcdonald's thing of how much you know how far out of impact do you do you think and this is why i think pattern thinking is so important because if you can cultivate healthy patterns in your system then you don't have to worry so much about the impacts you can't see and how it's part of everything else because you're going to have at least a reasonable presumption it's going to at least try and be a good neighbor in 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 the bigger scope um and the other thought i had i i feel both blessed and cursed i guess in in that um I have rarely worked in a situation where what my technology skills right now are the same ones I need 2 years from now or 18 months or 3 days or whatever depending on the context. So I've always approached this as it's a constant learning challenge. That's all it is. There is nothing else. It is just learning. Like you know, there's no there's no space and I have interacted more with people that have pretty much stayed in the same context or with the same language or technology tools for a really long time and i think that that is both again a blessing and a curse like it, it it makes it harder to adopt new patterns but it makes it also harder to see that our role is to look into the next abyss like it's not to get to the point where you're the most expert because whatever is you need I mean if I were a cold fusion developer it would not be paying my mortgage right now like still right like that so so it's this the this question of how we're evolving our skill set is um is crucial to um like it, people like i think we're going to move away from i'm a javascript developer i'm a drupal developer i'm a, and it, and instead we're going to talk about the problems we solve using technology tools regardless of the technology tools that we happen to be using on any given day and i i think the more we move in that direction i think the more uh interesting the problems we can solve will become and of course everybody's favorite topic domain driven design and systems thinking um how do those fit together i probably would like your input on the strategic tools of domain driven design so meaning establishing what domains and sub like how you how you create boundaries in the in oh well i mean just in terms of using domain driven design strategic design with systems thinking sorry yeah. yeah they're to me they're the same they're the same i mean i had like <laughs> i talked at a domain driven the first time i spoke at a domain driven design con which conference which was wonderful and i but i also felt like i met my people like like suddenly i'd say things and the stranger would say things back and we just have a conversation and we understood <laughs> so i you know it really reinforced and there's there's it's not the only one but one really good example where system thinking is so inherent in doing domain driven design that they don't I wouldn't even be able to tease them apart. I think domain driven design is a pattern way of applying system thinking. You can imagine um making a completely different way, but why when one you have one that works? But I think that it 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 lets you draw um draw boundaries make trade-offs communicate uh, without having without having to resort to linear rock logic until you get there at a point so there's nothing wrong with that and at some point that is actually what you're doing is you're getting very concrete but it enables anything and ddd especially is is brilliant at this anything that enables you to do the macro to micro up and down the scale without making a a hierarchy that trickles down you know here here we have a strategy that will trickle down to the people implementing like 
um, isn't a systemic approach, right? The high, that hierarchical approach is very linear. So you kind of can't get away from it. In, yeah, they're yeah. the same. I, I think one cool thing about domain-driven design is it gives you places to agree and it gives you places to disagree. And everybody's still right. Yeah, and that, right, because it's un the uncertainty aspect, right? That's why systemic reasoning, and that's why this is like, we can't, we can't, we can't act on right, because right is, can, mm, my husband and I say, the stories don't have to be the same, meaning I can be angry because he's late, and he can tell me the story of why he's late, and I totally understand, like it was, he, I totally empathize with why he's late, but I, I didn't know that when he was late, so that's not the experience I had <laughs> while I was standing there on the street corner waiting for him to pick me up or whatever it was. And so this, this um, you know, things, things that allow us to come together and let different points of view be different while looking for where they need to synthesize is just classic systems, right? Where there is independence of parts and there, you know, I am a individual person with my own, um, with my own authority in, in myself. And at the same time, of course, I'm not that at all, right? There's not really a boundary between me and other people. So as long as we are able to understand that the models we make are always defeasible, like circumstances change, so do the models. Like it only represents one view in one moment. Um, if we, if we always design like that together, then we'll have not perfect, but generally healthy, um, system design, except for all of the other complexity that makes them <laughs> difficult, but we're just going to pretend in this moment that, that, <laughs> that that's manageable. Yeah. And I, you know, one, uh, I guess analogy that I like to draw on is, homes as in houses uh, that are built or large office buildings that are built, whatever, stadiums, indoor stadiums, outdoor stadiums. Um, for example, part of the system um, is an air conditioner, but that's a system in itself, right? An air conditioning system, but that's just a subsystem in a house and the house is is a system, but it's only a subsystem in an environment. So for example, if you live in a hot, humid environment, the hot and humid is going to happen and you can't really prevent it, but you can disagree with it and you can create a different environment with, you know, cool, dry air um, inside a subsystem, which is actually a system by using a system that's just a subsystem. And if you completely disagree with all that, then you can move, you know, relocate to a place that's um, hot and arid or cool and arid maybe. But um, so the systems around us, um, we sort of become subsystems and we don't have to agree and still we can tolerate the systems that we're living within or interacting with and uh when domain driven design you know presents this kind of opportunity i think it's really great because actually when the business people disagree and everybody's still right then that's exactly the kind of thing that we have to allow to happen right mm -hmm. enable that and then well, then we're all happy. I guess. Yeah, and this goes back to the um, the often we don't agree on even what the core subdomains are, whatever that or the core subdomains are, in the sense of um, if it's a stadium and it's in Arizona and it's air conditioning, right? Like um, there's there might be five competing priorities for the for where we should invest in the system. Should we invest in the air conditioning, for example, right? So there's there's all of these different art, but that what really matters is, 
is this move us towards our highest mission, our what we do, the most valuable thing that we do, and that this is back to the cat and chicken herding <laughs> piece of like most of the time, even in my own mind, we're running around in a circle because we're prioritizing all these other things or we're taking into consideration all these other um oh, but you know, it'd be nice. We could, if we had air conditioning, we could, but we're now using different criteria than the what we've established to decide what matters to us. And it, it can really get messy fast, right? So what I really appreciate is that there's a mechanism for making trade-offs in, in, the, in, like in how you're describing. It's not just, do we need air conditioning or not, but it makes you have to put it in the context in, that you're solving for. Right. As opposed to just, is air conditioning good? Is air conditioning bad? Let's debate. Like <laughs> Everybody can make their choice. Diana, I've really enjoyed this discussion today and I'm excited for our listeners to hear it in the near future. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I'm very interested in keeping track of your work. Well, thank you. Thank, and th this is great. I'm, I really appreciate um, this conversation. Even if other people weren't going to hear, I still would have thoroughly enjoyed just talking through this. So thank you. Thank you so much. I agree. Thank you again, and we'll talk to you soon.